This is Professor Rogers. Max Weber is one of the foundational figures in organizational studies. He is best known for his description of the characteristics of bureaucracy, but many miss the point of his argument, which I will develop in this video. Throughout the semester, I come back to this slide on the foundational traditions in organizational studies. Weber is one of the progenitors of the tradition on the left, bureaucratic and administrative management. Weber, notice that I pronounced the first letter of his last name as a V and not a W, lived in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The dates are important because his writings underscore a unique concern of the era, specifically how to deal with the rise of large-scale organizations like factories, armies, and government bureaucracies. In the wake of these events, many questions were asked, such as, why had the use of bureaucratic organizations become so prevalent? And practically speaking, how could someone manage such large institutions? Weber taught at some of the leading German universities of his time, and was referred to in his own era as a political economist. However, his writings were sociological in nature, and he is now regarded as one of the major classical theorists in sociology, as well as one of the founders of the discipline of sociology in Germany. However, he had little influence in the United States until 20 years after his death because his works had not been translated into English right away. Theoretically, Weber was interested in what he referred to in German as Verstehen, or what we might call in English a mindset. Weber's use of Verstehen was not about a formal set of beliefs or values, but a way to write about maps that people carry around in their heads to guide behavior. Behaviors, he believed, had to be interpreted in the light of these cognitive maps. As such, Weber was critical of much of the social science of his day for paying insufficient attention to why people behaved as they did. Let's look at a simple example to understand what Weber meant. When two people approach each other in a store aisle in the United States, each person usually moves to the right of the aisle, even though there is no law that says we must. From a Weberian perspective, it is important that we engage in this behavior voluntarily and not because of force. We carry around in our heads a rule that says we always should move to the right when we are in two-lane traffic, a habit that we may have developed from obedience to traffic laws. The incredible thing about this rule is we follow it in grocery stores even though there is no law requiring us to act this way in this setting. Weber was not interested in trivial matters like grocery store etiquette. Instead, he was interested in the cognitive maps making possible the rise of capitalism. He regarded Marx's focus on economic determinism and Herbert Spencer's social evolutionary theories as insufficient explanations of why history moved in one direction and not another. As a result, he used the concept of Verstehen to highlight people's motivations and perceptions. His concerns about the organization of capitalism included, but were not limited to, the influence of the Protestant religion, the contribution of social hierarchies to social and political organization, and how a particular view of the use of power spurred the use of bureaucracies in all kinds of organizations. Weber's preoccupation with Protestantism was not unique. Several 19th century social thinkers observed that capitalism was expanding faster in Protestant areas of Europe and the Americas than Catholic ones. For Weber, the impact of Protestantism was not its stated theological tenets about the nature of God or salvation, but the individual ethics that Protestantism engendered. Weber claimed that Protestantism supplied a mental roadmap of moral behavior built around values such as frugality, hard work, and honesty. In other words, Protestants were taught to shun materialism, to regard labor as a duty performed before God, and to avoid lying in personal or business dealings. To Protestants, the need to engage in these types of behaviors was self-evident. Weber regarded these values, which he termed the Protestant ethic, as essential to the growth of early modern capitalism. In deliberate contrast to Marx's economic determinism, 
which regarded the economy as the sole driving force in the formation of the religious and moral superstructure of societies, Weber saw religion and moral values as contributing to the development of societies. Weber was also interested in the influence of social hierarchies. On this point, he was again responding directly to Karl Marx, who thought about societal organization solely in terms of economic classes. Weber accepted Marx's premise that economic classes existed, but he also recognized the influence of a second type of hierarchy, social status. He highlighted how high levels of prestige are granted to some people regardless how much money they make. For example, as a society we often describe college professors as prestigious because of their expertise, even though the median salary for a full-time college professor is less than $60,000 a year. We grant professors this prestige in spite of the quirky things for which they are well known, like taking stuffed animals to the Canfield Fair. By the way, some of you may have correctly recognized that the stuffed animal in this picture is the statistics penguin, but that is another course. Finally, Weber stated that social change did not depend solely on hierarchies. He was among the first to realize that low-class and low-status individuals could band together to form a political party to influence public affairs. Most important to our class on administrative and management theory were Weber's discussion of legitimate authority and bureaucracy. We give this matter extensive attention because Weber's ideas on bureaucracy are one of the starting points in the tradition of bureaucratic and administrative management. The Weberian tradition distinguishes between power and authority. Power is the ability to make someone work toward your goals. This control over others can come through a variety of different methods, legitimate and non-legitimate, such as persuasion, social norms, or holding a gun to one's head. Authority is a subset of power. It is power whose use is accepted as legitimate by those who are on the receiving end of its exercise. Weber proposed three different ways in which authority is legitimately exercised. Charisma is an authority of person. We follow charismatic leaders solely because of their personal appeal. Traditional authority is rooted in custom. An example is the long-standing practice of royal families to pass the crown to the eldest male. Adherence to the custom is seen as more important than determining which of the royal heirs might make the best monarch. Finally, rational legal authority is an authority anchored in a position or office and in rules. When we say that no one in our society, not even the president, is above the law, we are invoking law as a form of rational legal authority. Weber believed that reliance on rational legal forms of authority had increased with modernity. Mathematics, modern science, musical notation, and orderly summaries of political platforms or religious doctrines were all seen by Weber as expressions of rational legal authority. However, Weber regarded the most important kind of rational legal authority in modern times to be the use of bureaucracies to organize groups of people. I won't elaborate in detail on the characteristics of a bureaucracy here except to highlight two points. First, bureaucracies have lines of authority that converge as we move toward the top, giving bureaucracies a pyramidical command and control structure, with each person in the pyramid assigned a clearly defined role. Second, people who work in bureaucracies are governed by explicit written policies and procedures. Suffice it to say that Weberians see bureaucracies everywhere, corporations, armies, governments, universities, and small clubs all apply a similar set of organizational principles and structures. Many people misunderstand Weber's intent. They look at the list of characteristics of a bureaucracy, and if a successful organization does not implement one well, 
or maybe even omit one, they say, aha, Weber was wrong. Here, however, is where Weber's focus on Verstehen becomes important. Weber did not say that every organization perfectly implements the characteristics of a bureaucracy. Rather, our behaviors in organizations are guided by an ideal type of what a bureaucracy should look like. This ideal type exists as a map in our heads that we call up whenever we seek to organize people. It was the map, not its actual implementation, which was the focus of Weber's scholarship. For example, try imagining a contemporary organization that does not have a person using one of the titles on the left. All these titles are offices that, in our heads, assume that the person sits atop of a bureaucratic pyramid. Individuals in these bureaucratic structures do not rule by personal decree and emotional whims, as is the case with the leaders on the right but instead are subject to the organization's formal policies and procedures. How pervasive are bureaucracies? The titles on the left are used regardless the size of the organization. Even if such elaborate organizational structure is not needed and even cumbersome, many family-owned corporations end up assigning titles like president, vice president, secretary, and treasurer to members of the family maybe even minors. One small business owner for which I once worked named himself president, his wife as vice president, and his two daughters as the remaining positions. The annual business meeting was held once a year at a family dinner. Any time you encounter a formal job description or written policies and procedures, you are also probably seeing a bureaucracy at work. Much of how we think about bureaucracies in modern society comes from Max Weber. However, let me close with Weber's warning. Weber was concerned that rational legal authority is becoming too pervasive, and that it is like we are wearing an iron cage. The term iron cage is probably better translated as iron clothing. Imagine yourself wearing clothes made of iron. You wouldn't be able to move much. Weber's claim is that the ubiquitous nature of bureaucracy and other types of rational legal authority are stifling, turning us into a people without heart or spirit. Weber was not alone in his concern about relying solely on bureaucratization to run social and organizational life, and over the semesters we will see others discuss the limits of bureaucratic command and control structures.